Welcome back to Road to Salt. Salt community, my name is Luke. I'm part of the Salt community team, and I'm just so excited you guys are taking time out of your day to join us on this webinar. For those of you who are brand new, Road to Salt is just this name that sort of helps us understand all of us are on a journey. We want to use technology and creativity, communication, social media, filmmaking, all that stuff to make the greatest impact we can for the cause of Christ in our community. All of us are on a different part of that journey, but we're all on this road together. And so that's why we call this webinar series Road to Salt, that we're all trying to take another step together. So I'm so excited you guys have joined us. Uh, many of you may be new to the salt community and kind of what we do. And so when we say, hey, you're part of the salt community now, what we really mean is that you're on the inside. You're gonna start getting some emails from us. I promise we will not blow up your inbox. Uh, about news and trends that may be coming because we want you to stay on the cutting edge and stay inspired in the craft that you have for your community. We also want to equip you with webinars and resources, conference, training uh, events, stuff like that, of like you're attending now so that you can stay on the cutting edge of your skill set. So you can be equipped in that way. But we also want you to be a part of this community so that you have a place to belong. We know that ministry can be very isolating, especially when you're in creativity and technology and you kind of feel like when you're in those meetings, no one else gets you. I want you to know this is a community where you are known, where, where someone does get you. And so hopefully at the end of sort of you being a part of a couple of events, you go, man, these are my people. They get me and they see me. So I'm super excited you guys are here. If you can't tell, uh, we are in a brand new studio. Our team has worked really hard over sort of the Christmas break uh, while we were sort of taking a little bit of time off. And uh, we've built this brand new studio. So we've got new lights, new gear, new set. Uh, it's a new year and I'm excited about that. We've also got a bunch of new faces coming to the Road to Salt series this year. I can't wait for you to meet them. But as we kick things off in this episode, we're gonna have a familiar face. For those of you who joined last year, you may remember Noah uh, from Hunts. And so I wanna invite Noah on uh, so you guys can hear a little bit about what they do and sort of how they participate. Noah, are you there? I am. Thank you so much, Luke. Good to see oh. everybody and uh, happy February and happy new year. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. You guys uh, are up uh, in the Northeast, so it's a little bit colder there than it is here in Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> Just a little bit, just a little bit. We were talking earlier, it was uh, maybe about a, a 40 degree difference in weather today yeah. uh, between up here and where you guys are. <laughs> it's a, a rare February for us. So uh, well, I'm super excited you guys are here. Give us a little bit of a preview of Hunt's photo video, not just what you guys are doing to support salt in our community, but kind of the, the greater church at large. For sure, yeah. So Hunt, uh, as you mentioned, Luke, we're based out of New England. Uh, we're actually New England's uh, longest uh, and largest photo and video retailer. We've been around since 1889. Uh, funny enough, we started off as a drugstore um, and in the 1980s transitioned over to a full photo and video retail outlet. So we support not only the New England area, uh, but photographers, creators all over the entire country. Uh, that's one of my roles is to actually help support and do a lot of outside sales working with amazing organizations like SALT to support the church community. Uh, but we also do a lot of other events and a lot of other different spaces too. So for us, it's all about giving back, being able to support those creators, being able to build relationships with our customers. We want to be more than just your average retailer. We really want to be there to support you during the purchase, after the purchase, and even beforehand as well when you're trying to figure out what you're going to need to get the best setup possible for whatever you're trying to produce. So that's what we're all about. Uh, I'm really excited to be on here with you all this week uh, and actually really excited to be back uh, with SALT this year. We attended in 2021 and did a couple of webinars last year. So looking forward to this year and working more with everybody going forward. Oh, I'm so grateful for that. And I'm honestly grateful for y'all's partnership. You guys have brought incredible resources uh, to our community. And so you're bringing this one. I mean, when you kind of called us up and said, hey, we've got another partner we'd love to help uh, introduce to the SALT community that has incredible insights uh, when it comes to sort of this cinematic look. Talk a little bit about kind of what we're about to hear and our guest today. For sure, yeah. I'm really uh, honored to be partnering with Panasonic and uh, honored that Panasonic has agreed to sponsor this webinar with us today. Uh, on with us, we have Matt Frazier. Uh, Matt Frazier, uh, I have forget his official title, but I will let him uh, share his official title. But uh, he is great with all 
thing uh, on the Panasonic Lumix side, and he's going to be talking a little bit about a little bit today about how you can create more of a cinematic look with more of a budget-friendly setup, which is something I think we are all trying to go for, trying to get the best outcome as possible uh, with spending the least amount of money as possible. Everybody has a budget to work within, so whenever we can save a little bit of money, that is always great without having to sacrifice our overall final product and image quality. So Matt's going to come on in just a minute here and share some information with us about how you can actually achieve that in your day-to-day -day work. I love that. And it's honestly a perfect topic to kick the year off because this is the thing our team has spent a lot of time thinking about as we were kind of looking at this new studio is how do you increase that sort of depth of field and cinematic look. So with that, let's hand it over to Matt and let him take it away. Take it away, Matt. And I think most importantly, thank you, Salt Community, for uh, welcoming me in and to hear what I have to say about uh, creating a more cinematic look on a more affordable budget. So uh, before we get started, my name is Matt Frazier. I work in business development for uh, Panasonic Lumix. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the presentation so everybody can take a look at it. Um, important to note, I, I realize that you'll be working on projects. You might be looking to um, outfit your facilities. Um, you may need to outfit your sanctuary and you might want some advice. So if you scan that QR code, that's gonna get you a V card um, to my contact information. So that's my email address. That's also my cell number. Uh, I'm here to help you all out. So um, I also understand that it's gonna be in the chat as well, including a link to our Lumix Professional Solutions uh, webpage. That's different from the consumer page. It's very much focused on live production, along with recorded production. So uh, feel free to check us out. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to help you out. So let's talk about creating a cinematic look. I think before we can uh, talk about creating the look, we probably should define the look first. So what is a cinematic look? You know, at the end of the day, a cinematic look takes, for most people, it's three parts. There's three parts to a cinematic image. Um, the one that everybody recognizes right away is a shallow depth of field um, where the background's very blurry and our subject is very much in focus. Uh, but there are two other aspects to a shallow depth of, um, sorry, to a cinematic look that I think people oftentimes overlook. Um, the second aspect is the highlight roll off. So when we look at the sun that's poking through these leaves in the tree, um, a lot of times with a video camera, we would end up doing something called clipping that highlight. It would end up being a very, very stark white instead of this kind of nice muted yellow. So you can still see some tonality in the sun. Um, so cinema cameras oftentimes have a very shallow roll off of those highlights. So they don't clip very hard. Uh, this is important when you're dealing in certain sanctuaries where there's probably gonna be windows behind, um, you know, the minister who's giving the service. So having a camera that has really nice smooth roll off and those highlights is very beneficial. The third aspect is how we render skin tones, um, how we render people's faces. You know, video cameras oftentimes have a very kind of hard look to the image, uh, very sharp, uh, which initially looks great until we start to get people on camera who maybe have some blemishes they don't want to be quite as apparent. So the key is the balance, having a sharp image with one that's flattering to people's skin. And so, Sometimes you can even use some tricks. So this is a top trick for anybody out there who's looking to create a cinematic look. Um, there are filters made. I look up a filter called a black pearl mist filter. That'll help to knock off some of the sharpness of an image. So if you feel like your video images look a little too sharp, uh, black pearl mist filters can oftentimes knock down that look and give a more flattering image when you're trying to do a live event, trying to create something that's more cinematic. Um, Naturally, most cinema cameras and you know select cameras by Panasonic have a look that's softer while still maintaining good sharpness. So let's start with creating the shallow depth of field, which is really the first um, and probably the, the area that takes the most effort to create for a, a cinematic look. So the first thing to consider is that to get a shallower depth of field, it's going to really revolve around the sensor size. How big is that? film plane, the sensor that we're using in the camera. The larger the sensor, the easier it is to create shallower depths of field. 
Uh, do keep in mind though, the byproduct of this is that the lenses are going to get quite a bit larger as well. So just bear, bear that in mind as you're looking at these products, oftentimes it's gonna be picking the right sensor size to the space we have to accommodate the lens and the camera body. So um, the largest sensor that is usually used for cinematic production, and, and honestly, this is a new sensor size for movies. It's the full frame sensor. That's what's used in photographic cameras. Uh, it's what we've used for film stock for, you know, ever since like the 1920s in photo cameras. And that film stock is very large. We're going to call this our reference just because it's the most commonly used film stock for photography. So a lot of people think of this as the starting point for how we determine shallow depth of field. So keep in mind that that sensor is 36 millimeters wide. And when we shoot video, we shoot in a 16 by nine aspect ratio. So it's going to be at about 20 millimeters tall. So this is a really big sensor. In fact, it's bigger than what most cinema cameras use. Um, most cinema cameras use something called Super 35. You may hear it called APS-C. Um, that's usually a photo term for a similar sized sensor. And we call this about a half frame. We call it a half frame size sensor. It's a 24.6 millimeter width. Um, and this would be the bulk of what people shoot movies on. In fact, uh, I'm gonna switch back to my camera. Uh, right now, I'm using a Super 35 sized sensor for what we're seeing. And so you're getting that shallow depth of field in the image I'm presenting to you right now. Um, we'll get into exactly what I'm doing to get the shell depth of film in a moment, but I want you to get an idea of what a Super 35 size sensor would render for shallow depth of field. And I'll give some more details about the setup here in a minute. So micro four thirds is the format that I use a lot. Um, and I, I, I like it because it's really flexible and I work for Panasonic and we're one of the creators of the format. So full disclosure, I, I love it because I work for Panasonic as well. But what I love about this is that it's a quarter the size of the sensor we would use in our full frame camera. And this means that it can give me more depth of field if I want it. So if I want to create more of a video look, I have that ability to do so. But it's still a massive lens, in, or sorry, massive sensor in comparison to most video cameras that you probably used. So it can produce shallow depths of field and there's lots of lens choices for it. So it, you can get really shallow depth of field lenses to match it. And so it's a, I, I consider it kind of a chameleon sensor size. It can kind of play in both parts really effectively. So if you've ever used a studio camera um, and it's a really high end one, those sensors are two thirds of an inch. And this is where things get um, more apparent for sensor size change. This is only 8.6 millimeters wide. So it's literally a 16th the size of a full frame sensor. I can fit 16 of the most expensive production uh, studio camera sensors on the surface of a full frame sensor. That should give you an idea of how small these sensors are. And if you're using more of the smaller electronic news gathering style cameras with like an SDI port on it, um, they're probably using a third of an inch sensor. And that means I'm going to fit 56 of those sensors on a 35 millimeter camera sensor. So just to make you aware of how, how much smaller those sensors are in most video cameras and how much larger the sensor goes in these more cinematic look cameras, this is the single biggest area of distinction is that sensor size. But we don't just get shallow depth of field by going to a larger sensor. We have to have some zoom, some focal length. So right now I'm in a pretty tight crop on my image to create more shallow depth of field. And we have to factor in the aperture of the, the lens opening. How large is that lens opening? The larger the lens opening, the more light we're letting in, the byproduct of this is you're gonna have a shallower depth of field, meaning the background's gonna be blurrier. And so a lot of the confusion people run into is that they have to look and figure out how shallow do I wanna go and what am I currently using and how am I gonna figure out what is the right camera for me as I move into a new camera system. So when we look at a full frame sensor, that if we use an F4 lens, we would consider it an F4 depth of field. It's again, the reference that we always use. If I want the same depth of field on a Super 35 sensor, I would use an F2.8 lens. So I'm gonna to have to use a lens that's one stop brighter than I would use on a full frame camera to get the same depth of field at the same angle of view, okay? In Micro Four Thirds, I would use an F2 lens. And there's lots of F2 lenses available in Micro Four Thirds. There's lots of F2.8 lenses available for Super 35 and APS-C cameras. So I can get similar depths of field 
if my goal is an F4 depth of field in a full frame, whether I do micro four thirds, super 35 or full frame. But if I wanna create that shallow depth of field in F4 look with a studio camera, I would have to have an aperture of F1.05. So the lens would be enormous. <laughs> It'd be very difficult. And frankly, no one makes an F1.05 for a studio camera. And on a third of an inch sensor, I would have to use an F.55. So it would be an enormous front element on that, on that sensor. And there is no such thing as an F.55. So you can see that it's very difficult for us to create shallow depths of field with the smaller sensors because there's no lenses available that can do that on those smaller sensors. So now that we understand how we create that depth of field by picking our sensor size and our aperture of lens, Let's talk about how we can evaluate our sanctuary and determine what is the right sensor for our space and what is the right depth of field that we wanna produce for our space. So I think the first mistake people will go to is they'll start to um, buy equipment without first testing it. And one of the benefits of having a community um, you know, of churchgoers is that you're gonna have photographers who are attending that, that church. So. The first thing I would do is I'd look for the photographers who are in your congregation and ask if you can borrow a couple of their cameras and get an idea of how wide an angle of view that camera produces. And you can then begin to associate which camera you want to use for the different positions that you're going to be um, setting up your cameras. So keep in mind that the longer that zoom, the shallower that depth of field is going to get. So Here's some advice I would give. First off, if you have photographers that are in the group and they have a full frame camera, I would start with a full frame photographic camera and ask if you can borrow a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. That, that's the easiest or a 50 millimeter lens. And what I would do is I would then stand at the position where I want that camera to be placed. I would then attach that lens and try to zoom to see if you can get close enough. That's pretty simple, pretty easy to figure out. If you don't have access to a zoom lens, what you can do is you can get a 50 millimeter lens and then start at your position and walk forward until you get the angle of view that you're looking for. Um, I'm gonna flip to my camera to make this a little easier. So if you're using a 50 mil, a non-zoom lens, what you'll do is you'll walk in and get closer to where you're going to want the angle of view. So you're looking to try to get as close an angle of view as you wanna replicate. Every time you get twice as close to where your original position was, you need to double your focal length. So if my position was 20 feet away and I had to move up 10 feet on a 50 millimeter lens, that means I'll need a 100 millimeter lens on a full frame camera to get that same equivalent angle of view. And so the first step is to start with a borrowed camera, select the angle of view that's gonna look right, and then take a look at the depth of field and determine if that depth of field on that full frame camera is what you want. If you're on an F1.8 lens and only the nose is in focus and it's out of focus by the time it gets to the eye, or only the eyes in focus and the nose is out of focus and the ears are out of focus, well, that tells you you probably need a smaller aperture lens because you wanna still keep the entire head in focus for the, for the production. So um, I find that starting with borrowed lenses, especially like a 50 millimeter F1.8, it gives you enough control over depth of field to give you an idea of what you're gonna look like, okay? And so once you've done some experimentation with the camera, it's at that point that you have to determine the sensor size. Um, you may find that a full frame camera for your back positions on longer lenses just gives you way too shallow a depth of field. And so you may decide that you would rather do a super 35 or a micro four third sensor for back of house, but you may have cameras that are close that you need a shallower depth of field, or you may have cameras that you wanna mount on instruments, like you wanna mount it on a, on a piano, or you wanna mount it on a drum kit, and that's gonna be a real close camera and you still wanna shallow that depth of field. That's where the full frame sensor really becomes in handy at that point. Um, one flexibility to consider is they'll look at full frame cameras because oftentimes they'll give you the opportunity to crop to a super 35 region of the sensor. So you can use the crop cameras at the back of house and then use the same camera for close-ups and still get a shallow depth of field on the full sensor width as well. So
So once you've selected your cameras, one of the biggest challenges people run into is that if we're putting cameras at back of house, we wanna be able to control zoom. And these DSLR and mirrorless style cameras, they don't usually have power zoom lenses available. So um, if you're working with a full frame camera, your options are gonna be pre pretty limited here. Um, full frames, long zoom lenses are, you know, Fujinon is offering a 25 to 1000. That's a $150,000 lens. For a lot of productions, they don't have the budget to be able to afford a lens like that. And so you want to look for some more budget-friendly options. One of my favorite budget-friendly options is actually made by Canon. Um, Canon offers two different lenses. They offer an 18 to 80 and a 70 to 200. Both of these are f f 4.4, what they call T 4.4. And these are servo zoom lenses. And you can attach them to many different cameras. When you use them with Panasonic, you can buy an adapter and the adapter will actually communicate between the lens and the body. It'll power the zoom and everything for you. And these two lenses will cover a super 35 region of the sensor and give you a really nice shallow depth of field look um, while giving you power zoom or servo zoom control. So this is a nice way to go from a you know, $150,000 lens down to lenses that are about four to $5,000 a lens. But I'm a, real, I'm a realist. I know that some of you are gonna wanna get to a more affordable price point as well. Um, if you want more information on using this Canon adapted lens, go ahead and scan that QR code. That QR code will take you to an article that I've written on using adapted with Lumix cameras and all the accessories that you need to be able to do that. So it's a nice, easy to read article for you if you wanna read it. If you'd like to use a more traditional lens, um, Sorry, this is just how we would use the Canon lens. If you'd like to use a more traditional lens, a uh, non-servo zoom lens, there are servo attachments that you can purchase. So companies like Tilta offer the Nucleus M. And the Nucleus M, this device here is your servo motor for zoom. And then this is a second motor if you want for focus. Uh, you wouldn't need focus with our cameras because we can do focus through our app. And then these are grips that you can attach to your tripod. One would be for zoom and one would be for iris and focus. So you could do just one grip and then one zoom motor. And then this would control zoom with a camera operator. Um, if your camera has a length control, there's a company called Crozeal and they make this called the zoomer that can be attached and it just connects to the length controller of your camera. And then you can use your traditional length control zoom functions built into your tripod as well. Um, so these sort of accessories can really lower the cost of your lens purchase because like a Panasonic 70 to 200 F4, that's a $1,700 lens. The Canon equivalent is $5,000 with servo built in. This kit with just the, the grip and the first zoom, lens, uh, zoom motor, that kit's about $800. So for under 20, you know, for under $2,200, $2,300, you can get the same basic zoom control of the Canon 70 to 200 that costs 5,000. Or you can purchase the Crozeal motor and admittedly the Crozeal is a little more expensive, it's about $2,000. But then you don't need any grip controllers. It will work within almost any workflow because it's a length based control. And if you want more information on these devices, there's some QR codes that you can scan. Those QR codes will help you to uh, get some more information on those accessories. So when picking out a lens, I think it's important to look not only at um, whether I'm gonna have zoom control, but you wanna ask yourself, how is that lens gonna behave when it's mounted to the camera? Um, a lot of times photo lenses, while they're inexpensive, they're not gonna give the greatest look when you have to use them for a live event. Uh, one of their biggest problems is that when, a, a lot of times for a live event, we're gonna set the, we're gonna set our focus once, and then we wanna put the camera in manual focus. And with most you know, studio production cameras or electronic news gathering cameras, the, the camcorder style product, when you zoom in on a subject and you set focus and then you put it to manual focus, when you go wide, it keeps everything in focus for you. This is called parfocal. And most of the photo camera lenses don't include parfocal functionality. Now, it's important to note that Panasonic on all of our full frame cameras, uh, we have a parfocal motor drive system. So all of our zoom lenses behave like they're parfocal. And most of the micro four thirds lenses from us behave like they're parfocal as well. So you're gonna get a really beautiful look where you can just set the focus once and then you can just leave it in manual focus. And as you zoom, you don't have to worry it'll automatically keep everything in focus on the stage for you. Um, 
you also want to look at how much control does the iris have. Uh, with video cameras, we're used to very granular steps in iris, whereas most photo cameras are like third of the stop, which means that when you change the aperture, it gets very coarse. It gets very bright or very dark, and it sometimes it's hard to find that equilibrium where it's right. Uh, our lenses are always tenth of a stop, so you get lots of granularity in the iris. And then lens breathing. So there's a little video clip here at the bottom. I'm going to play it now. The image on the left is one of my competitor's lenses. And what you should notice is as we focus from the charts in the background to the Lumix logo on the lens, on, on the camera, you'll see that the background breathes. It actually goes back and forth. So we'll go ahead and play that. So on the image on the left, you'll see that it the angle of view literally changes. You're seeing more or less of that chart. The image on the right, as we focus from the camera to the charts in the background, it never breathes. So it's very smooth as it's changing focus, which means you're going to be less distracted when you're watching your subject uh, on screen. So this lens breathing and these benefits that are so unique to the Lumix lenses um, can be found. In fact, that Canon $5,000 lens includes all of these features in that price. So now I, I want to give you a little bit of a pitch on the Panasonic camera system so that you have some ideas of how you could use some of our cameras to create this more cinematic look. So um, we make box cameras and we make more traditional mirrorless, which kind of look like DSLR cameras. Um, and in the Lumix box camera system, they're great for what people are doing for houses of worship because they're so flexible. Um, and the, the example we have here is the GH, BGH1. And um, this sample, what it offers is a micro four third sensor so it can create a shallow depth of field. It can do 4K video at up to 60 frames per second in 10 bit. You can record internally, which is nice because then you can take it out of the sanctuary and use it for social media use if you need to or recording events that you're at. Uh, includes two SD card slots, but the best part is it has extensive inputs and outputs. So you get an HDMI port, but you also get an SDI port. So if you have long SDI runs that have already been run in place, uh, no need to buy adapters, it's just ready to go. Um, camera includes time code if you're gonna be recording. It also includes gen lock. So if you want to connect it to other uh, more professional movie cameras or broadcast cameras, you can have them all generation locked so that the sensors are all in sync. Uh, it includes a USB-C port and it includes a LAN port. So the great thing about the LAN port is that it actually allows me to power the camera over LAN, but I also have the ability to live stream from it. So I can incorporate it with switchers that can accept RTSP or RTMP protocols, and I can stream it up to 4K through this camera's output. Um, it's a it's a really awesome solution for remote production um, because there's an, a great application we have for this as well that can control up to 12 of these cameras, which I'll explain in a little bit. The last thing is that this camera's image quality is so exceptional that it was approved by Netflix. So it can be a primary Netflix camera. And for $2,000, it's the least expensive camera approved for Netflix productions. So that should give you an idea that this is truly going to give you a cinematic image. Now, a new camera that will start shipping sometime in May to June is the S52X. And I think the S52X for this um, use case, especially in House of Worship, is going to be a great option. It's not going to have as much input and output as our BGH1, but for many services, the IO of that camera is just not as important. And a lot of people want a really shallow depth of field and a full frame sensor, and this camera can deliver it, but they still want remote control compatibility. So let's walk through what this camera can do. So first off, it has our best autofocus system. So it uses a phase hybrid autofocus. So if you're not going to operate this uh, with a camera operator, it's a great way to have awesome autofocus. It is full frame, but it also offers that crop option. So um, if you like the depth of field you're seeing in the image that I've been showing you, um, let me just go ahead and pull my camera back up. So right now I'm in a Super 35 crop. I'm using a 50 millimeter lens on a Super 35 crop. I'm at a T2 point, I'm sorry, F2.2 right now as my f-stop. And the cabinets behind me, those cabinets are only two and a half feet away. And the camera that's in front of me is about three and a half feet away. So you can see I'm in a relatively small space here. 
um, we're covering roughly eight feet, give or take. And I'm getting this kind of shallow depth of field out of a super 35 crop. If I wanted the same angle of view on a full frame camera, it would be a 75 millimeter lens and I would be at F 3.5. And if I wanted to get this same look on a micro four thirds camera, I would use a 38 millimeter or 36 millimeter lens, and I would be at an F 1.8. So I can get this kind of look from micro four thirds, super 35 or full frame pretty easily. The nice thing about the S5 Mark II is that it can use either crop. So you can have it work in full frame or super 35. The camera's also capable of 6K video at up to 30 frames per second. Um, it can also live stream out up to uh, 4K 60P in 10 bit over Super 35. And it has great inputs and outputs for live event. Um, it uses a full size HDMI port, whereas a lot of these cameras are using a much smaller micro HDMI port. So that's right there. It also has a USB-C port, but this USB-C port has a trick you can purchase a USB-C to ethernet adapter and you'll be able to then connect this over network and you can use it for camera control, but you can also use it for RTMP and RTSP streaming. So if you're using a switcher that supports RTMP or RTSP, you just simply run an ethernet connection to this camera and you can run it right into the network um, with all the other cameras for operation. Now, Panasonic offers a remote control application called the Lumix Tether app for Multicam. Um, this application can control up to 12 cameras on network, and it can be a combination. It can be S5-2Xs. It can also be the box camera for the VGH-1. Um, we can control up to 12 cameras. In fact, what you'll see here is our control interface for selecting all of your cameras. Um, with select Lumix cameras, the two that I'm mentioning in particular, you have full menu access. So you can control the entire camera right from this um, interface. You can also trigger recording from here and you can make universal adjustments. So if you needed to change the aperture of all the lenses simultaneously because the sun position changed in the sanctuary, you can send out one command to change all of the apertures simultaneously if you need to. And this can be done over LAN. Um, it can also be done over USB-C. So, and it can be a mix. So some of these can be over a network, over ethernet. Some of them can be on USB-C. So if you have cameras that are closer to the switching system, you can just jack USB-C right into the computer and you're ready to go. So if you want more information or you want to download the application, um, the multi, our, our multicam link is the one in the middle. That's the Linux Tether for multicam. We also have a software development kit. So we have the ability to write custom software to control the camera. That's the uh, QR code on the left. And for people who just want to use the cameras as a really advanced webcam, um, our webcam application is also in the QR code on the right. Uh, just jack your camera into the USB-C port. It then gets recognized as a webcam. So now one final application I wanna to touch base on is to create a more cinematic look with a pan tilt zoom or an operator-less camera system because it's oftentimes hard to get enough volunteers to operate four to five cameras. Um, if you PTZ cameras today, you're gonna see that to get a one inch sensor, which is way smaller than any of the sensors we've talked about today, it's half the size of micro four thirds. You're talking about a 10 to $12,000 pan tilt zoom camera. Um, we've partnered with Data Video and Data Video makes the, this is the uh, PTR10 Mark II and the PTR10T Mark II. Uh, what makes this system awesome is that first off, it can, can do length control and it can also use Panasonic's control protocols. So we can control the uh, lens aperture. Uh, if you have a power zoom lens, we can control the power zoom of the lens um, all through their own remote control operator panels. But I worked with Data Video and Tilta and what Tilta had developed is this Nucleus M motor. So our friends at Data Video sell a kit called a Zeek 2. And the Zeek 2 will include your Tilta zoom motor. It include all the cabling you need to connect into the PTR10. It includes this bar for mounting your motor. And this will give you the zoom access for non-power zoom lenses. So you can do a pan, tilt, and zoom with practically any mirrorless or DSLR camera, um, the box camera as well. And so now you have effectively a very um, budget friendly, you know, this system is under $5,000 to get full PTZ control with a servo zoom lens um, from Panasonic, we use our box camera. 
So you can get a really inexpensive cinema look while it's remote controlled instead of having to have an operator operate the product. Um, for more information on this kit, feel free to uh, scan that QR code and that QR code will take you to Data Video's website. Um, there's also a great video from one of our ambassadors, Photo Joseph. Uh, Photo Joseph did an entire um, piece on how to work this product, and it's a really exceptionally well done YouTube video. Um, so with that, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So why don't we go ahead and turn it over to, to Luke, and uh, let's see if there's any questions out there. Matt, oh my gosh, that was incredible. Uh, I mean, I was like dialed in because I was watching all that and I'm like, you're blowing my mind. I mean, there's so much good stuff. I want to comment on one thing that I really appreciated in your presentation. Uh, one of the things that we believe in and passionately sort of um, work hard to, to sort of overcome is that there are differences between, you know, the cheapest possible solution, budget friendly, and sort of sacrificing quality at sort of that cost, right? And what I love is that I feel like what you really toted was a line. I mean, even between, you know, the lens breathing and all that sort of stuff, you really toted that line really comfortably of here's cost savings without going so into the deep end of sort of the cheapest possible uh, option. But you also kept quality high, which I so respect. I think that's something that we as a church need to be thinking about. So thanks for doing that. But my my mind was blown. I think the, the best thing that you sort of shared for me was really showing the different sensor sizes and highlighting how the f-stops change to get that depth of field. I mean, I know for us, we've had that question of like, okay, I have an ENG camera in our worship center. If we want to get that high depth of field, that's the reason for it. You've just given us the math. I also don't know how you've done it, but your head is like a calculator. I mean, you're just mathematically giving us all these numbers uh, back and forth. I, so I, I got some notes right now. Oh, okay. So you're cheating <laughs> a little bit. Hand. I didn't so I had to do some notes. Uh, I love it. It took, it took a little time to put together the full math on the slides. I, I appreciate it. So. I was sitting here going, if he asked me, what's the distance between that camera and that wall and me and what f-stop? I'm like, I couldn't do that. I would have no clue. So anyway, all right, let's get to some questions. By the way, if you have a question still and you want to ask, there's a bunch of questions that have come in. We're going to get to these. But if you've got a question, make sure you put that in the chat uh, below. We'll make sure we try and get to as many of them as we can here in the next kind of 15 minutes or so. A bunch of questions came out kind of right out of the gate. Uh, Peter Cook, Carol, both asked questions somewhat around latency of this. I'm going to read Peter's question because I think this sort of sums it up entirely. Um, he basically says, the problem we have with our Lumexes is that iMag and the video out latency is just too noticeable for speaker close-ups and some instruments like drums. Um, should we just use Lumexes on things like keyboard and wire choir wide shots? You want to speak a little bit, Matt, into kind of that uh, workflow and challenge? So I would first ask if it's possible for the questionnaire to include which Lumix cameras they're using if they know. Because um, I, so full disclosure, um, we, we do a little prep before these things and I had sort of seeded in a question on latency because I knew this was gonna come up and I wanted to make sure it got asked. Thank you for asking so we didn't have to seed it with some made up question, which is great. Uh, if you get us the, the camera, I can tell you if there's a way to kind of improve the latency, which there is. Um, so cameras like our box cameras with SDI, um, we recognize the latency was gonna be a problem. Our latency comes because we inject sound and video over the SDI or HDMI port. And so what's happening is the injection of audio and video is where that the majority of that latency is introduced. So if you've ever seen any of Panasonic's um, pan tilt zoom cameras, our PTZ solutions, if you want latency that's equal to those, which is under three frames of latency, um, that would be easy to do with our cameras as long as your camera has an option in the HDMI or SDI menu to turn off audio embedding. So if you stop embedding the audio into the video signal, it'll cut your latency in half. And in all applications that we've shown this to people, they've said that that corrects their latency issues enough for iMeg applications, okay? I love it. So By the way, he, just, to uh, just to reiterate, I'm sorry. He clarified for you, he's using the G7s and the G85s. They also have the CX350s. Yeah, so those two cameras, the, the Lumexes do not have the function that I'm talking about. Um, uh, they're in an older generation of engine, so you'd need to look at like our GH5 Mark II. Um, that'll do it. 
Uh, the GH6 will definitely do it if you want to stay in the micro four thirds family and the box cameras, the BGH1, that'll do it as well. So um, I'm sorry, you're going to have to replace the camera to cut down on the latency, but uh, it did require a new uh, processor for us to be able to make that happen. And the processors in those cameras are just not capable of it. I love it. Let me follow this up. Joel P just asked a question about uh, the R uh, TMP protocol and the latency converting to NDI. Can you can either of you speak to that? Yeah, so we're going to be at about 700 milliseconds over RTMP. Um, or our, in, in your case, you're probably going to use RTSP would be my assumption. RTMP is usually used for like if I want to go direct to YouTube or I want to go direct to Facebook. Um, RTSP is typically what we'd use. We count about 700 milliseconds of, of latency. So uh, if you're at 60 frames, a little over a second of latency. That's just kind of the nature of RTSP. Uh, I would not use that for iMeg. That might be a little bit extreme for latency. <laughs> so, but for the for the standard live output, it should be fine. Um, I will clarify something though. Some people are using RTMP for uh, virtual switching. So some people may want to take like five or six cameras and upload them all as RTMP signals and use a what we call virtual switcher. So it's instead of having to buy a very expensive, you know, high performance switching system, uh, they'll effectively just have the streams go up they open up a web interface and then they do their switching right from the web interface, um, which is a great way of doing things remote. So if you have somebody who wants to handle switching, but they don't want to stay, you know, at the facility for all of the services that day, you, you have the ability to do that remotely as well. I love that. There's also some questions coming in, Matt, around colors, color temperature, stuff like that. Jim S actually asked the question, uh, we have the same basic setup with two PTZ optics, 30 X, uh, but we're having issues with auto white changing. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, so it sounds like they're obviously using auto white balance. I would guess they're using auto white balance primarily, I would hope, because they have lots of windows. And so um, they're seeing like the lighting change throughout the day. So you're seeing like at sunrise, for sunrise service, you get that real warm, what we call golden hour kind of color. And then as you get closer to the evening, it's getting to those kind of blue, sort of kind of tealish color. And so you want the white balance to adjust automatically. Uh, the first thing I would say is that if you can, you should always manually white balance. Um, and the Lumix cameras offer manual white balance. So you can do that. Um, some of the Lumix cameras offer the ability to have an auto white balance that then will lock once you start your broadcast. So you can have it adjust throughout the day but then when you start to do the broadcast, it can then lock at that point. Because you know, you're usually within a one hour-ish window for most services, which means that the color of light shouldn't change too radically for that time frame. But for your PTI opti PTZ optics cameras, I would probably recommend um, doing a manual white balance for each of the services to make sure that it's not drifting on you. That's the way I would handle that. So speaking of that, Joey actually kind of asked that question, like he asked specifically, we'll get to his GH4 question, but what color temperatures should they be using to try and match to lighting so that it may look good on film? I know that that's kind of a, what's the light of your fright light? Do you have any resources maybe? Yeah, you what's can the light help? of your life, right? What's, yeah. what's the light of my life, right? That's gonna depend on a lot. Honestly, the way I do it, because I'm incredibly lazy, uh, the Lumix cameras and, and most, most cameras, this isn't exclusive, you know, it doesn't matter the brand, we all have this ability. I usually just keep a gray card, like a neutral gray card. Um, and with our app, the, the Lumix Tether app, um, I actually have the ability from the Tether app to use an eyedropper. And what I'll do is I'll just bring the 18 gray card and I'll bring it up onto set, you know, up on the stage. And then I'll just have somebody at the computer just drop the eyedropper on the gray card and then it'll just automatically set the white balance for me and I'll have to deal with it. And then you can just do that. If, if you have multiple services throughout the day, you just do that, you know, for each service, just before each service. And that'll get you pretty close. Talk or about you can kind of eyeball it, right? It, so you mentioned that you can control focus too through that app. It's not just color temperature, yeah. but I mean, what settings can you control with that app? Yeah, I wish I could switch it. It's not easy for me to switch because I have the app open on my desktop right now. But through this, through the through the streaming, I, it's not easy for me to switch to it. Um, the app can control everything. So I'm in I'm in autofocus now. So you know, like here's a servo zoom controller, and that's our little servo thing right there. So you can see autofocus is blah, blah, blah. it works great. Um, yeah. This is an S5 too, but. Um, from here, I have access to like level gauges. I can do uh, one shot AF. So if I want to keep the camera in manual focus, but 
um, I want to set focus, I can just touch the person's face on the screen and then hit one shot AF and a little box will come up and it'll focus on that. And then it'll immediately switch back to manual focus. Um, I can do white balance control from here. I can set ISO, I can set shutter. I can even fine tune white balance. So um, it's kind of like having, for more advanced live events, they use something called a paint box. Um, you know, companies like Scarhoy and CyanView, there's these little uh, paint box controllers that can give you tremendous control over uh, like the color matrix of the camera. You get most of that control from our app and you can do that with all the cameras that are on network. I love that. <laughs> Incredible. Do you get to see a live preview on that app? Yeah, you can actually see 12. So you can have a 12 up screen. So you can see all 12 cameras on screen at one time. Who needs a multi-view um, when you have that app, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> The only thing it's not great for is the actual video feed. So you're still gonna want to have a switcher or bring this, the video in. Um, it might be really tough taking like 120 by 210 resolution images and trying to crop those all out of like Streamlabs or something like that. So you're gonna want to use the individual video signals for the actual um, production. All right, let me ask this quick question. Joel P said, for the sure. BGH1, does it have a global shutter? It does not have a global shutter. Um, it's a very fast readout sensor. Uh, okay, so I'm sorry. That's that's this is like super nerd talk. So I know. Um, <laughs> There's me, a lot of nerdy questions, which so, is what I love about this. <laughs> yeah. So let's pretend that this memory card is my sensor. Okay. So that's our sensor. So what happens is that we capture the top of the image first. So the the first line of the image is captured, and then that image has to be fed down and then out into the engine, and then line two, and then line three, and then line four. So something moves fast in front of the camera. What happens is it was captured at the top of the sensor over here, and it was closer to the bottom of the sensor over here, and so it looks like it's at an angle. Um, so no, I'm sorry, we're not, in a, we're not using a global sensor. Um, I, I will say that for most services, it shouldn't be an issue, even with a drum kit. Um, especially with the BGH-1, because its readout speed is really fast. I, I have it being used for scientific applications now, where people are uh, literally um, trying to develop, uh, you know, PPE, the stuff that, so you don't have to wear masks. Uh, we could wear like a little device to pull smoke through. Um, it'll, it literally will clean the air around your body. And so they, they process that at, like, I think 100, it's like 240 frames a second. And they're finding that the rolling shutter is perfectly fine for what their applications are, so do with that as you will i love it uh joey p also asked what are some good settings to get good contrast and lightings for the gh4 settings to get good contrast um i think if you're trying to get the most dynamic range which i, I personally for like a for a you know a service if there's windows my biggest concern is always how much dynamic range can i get out of the sensor because i'm having to deal with bright light coming through the windows on a gh4 the the highest dynamic range you're going to get is to either a unlock v log but that's going to require a lot of post processing you're going to bring the video image in live and then use a program like assimilate which can then live grade the image so you can work with scratch assimilate to then live grade the image and turn it into a beautiful cinematic image from a log profile um, if you don't want to go that much trouble uh, cine like d is typically the best one. And then what I'll do is I'll bump my shadows up like maybe like plus two, but no more than plus two. And that'll give me a little more um, shadow detail. Uh, that That's how I'd usually shoot it. it it's Cine D. I love it. Do you have any sort of list of resources or documentation online that would show, uh, you had on, I think one of your slides, select G series lenses that are essentially parfocal. Do you have any sort of more detail that maybe we can get out? Yeah, I, I wish I wish our marketing department was that savvy to give you individuals on which ones. Um, I can tell you exactly which ones are parfocal in the Lumix line um, for G series. Uh, it's our we have an eighteen. Sorry, I got to do some math. It's an eight. It's our eight to eighteen um, like Leica. So it's an eight millimeter to eighteen millimeter Leica. That's going to be a little wide for a service. <laughs> we have a twelve to sixty Leica. That's an f two eight to four. We have a 50 to 200 um, Leica. We also have our brand new 12 to 35 F2.8 Leica. Um, I think that's all of them that are parfocal. So um, I'll go through them one more time. It's the, it would be the eight to 18. That's an F2.8 to four Leica. There's a 12 to 60 Leica. That's F2.8 to F4. There's the 50 to 200 Leica. 
that's an F2.8 to F4. There's the new 12 to 35 F2.8 Leica. And then there's two more I forgot, and I can't believe I forgot them because they're my absolute two favorite lenses for Micro Four Thirds. Um, we make a 10 to 25 F1.8 constant yeah, a 10 to 25 F1A constant wow. and a 25 to 50 F1A constant. Um, they are glorious. They're gorgeous lenses. It's what I use to shoot my kids' uh, senior pictures. It's, they're awesome lenses and they are um, they are also powerful. What we'll do, Matt, is we'll take that list that you just gave us. We'll make sure we type that up so that it's a little bit more easy to consume uh, when we kind of do our recap blog. So we'll make sure that. A couple of quick questions I want to suggest is like, sorry, go ahead. Go no, ahead. what were you going to say? Maybe we'll get you some links to the Hunts Photos webpage to the yeah, lenses. We'll let's make, do that. Make it easier. Um, a couple of quick questions I want to run through because there's a ton coming in. So I want to try and get to as many as we can in the next couple of minutes. Uh, Matt P said, we're wanting to switch out from the 20X to, to a follow camera setup for the sermon time, but I'm having trouble trying to figure out what we need to get. It'd be about 60 feet from the spot where this pastor stands. I don't know if that's enough info for you. C can you repeat the question? That's like a lot of stuffs. Yeah, Matt P, if you're listening to us ask this question, be ready to type in some clarifying <laughs> stuff here. And, and Matt P, you should have my email address. It's actually in the chat. So if yeah. you want to email me the question, if I don't answer it right, just email me. I'll, yeah. I'll be happy to answer it. But I, so I don't he, want to ignore it here. Yeah, he asked, we're wanting to switch out the 20X for a follow camera setup for the sermon time, but I'm having trouble figuring out what we need to get. It would be about 60 feet from the spot where the pastor stands. By a follow camera, I, I'm assuming that they're not asking for it to be on a gimbal. I wonder if they that's the, the like primary a camera. Head. Well, yeah, so he's probably just using it. He's using a robotic slider probably, and then he wants to maintain parallax. So there's, okay, so there's a really cool option that's going to be totally like Jerry rigged together. Um, so, so number one, buy yourself a DJI Ronin, <laughs> um, like an RS3 or an RS2, um, because you can mount that onto the uh, slider, and we can actually send. Um, the autofocus information to the Ronin. And what it'll do is it'll actually keep the minister uh, centered. So as the camera slides, the Ronin will actually turn for you and keep them centered because it's using our autofocus information, you know, like the tracking, like the box around our head, it uses that and it just keeps that centered. And then you just have the camera autofocus. So at 60 feet away, it just, I guess it just depends on how tight you want to be. If you want to be as tight as I'm in at 60 feet, Good luck following That's that. That's probably going to be at least 200 millimeters on a Super 35 sensor would be my guess. I'm kind of guessing off the top of my head here. Um, maybe 300 millimeters on a, on a Super 35 crop. That's probably where you're going to be at. Um, so I'd probably go with maybe a full frame camera just so you can do that. And that's like the S5 II or the S5 IIx would be great, um, especially since the autofocus is so good. So you'd have the ability to have that slider move. You'd have the Ronin actually you know, following the minister for you, and then you'd have the autofocus doing the autofocus work all at the same time, which probably makes it easy for you. Matt P, I'll let you follow up, but he did clarify for us, it is a manned camera setup waist up. So, uh, but we'll let you guys kind of get manned. Yeah, so it would be, okay. I think same he's just setup, saying followed. Just, yeah, almost the exact same setup, just remove the slider. Yeah. <laughs> and I would use one of the Ronins, because I think the hard part is if you're, if you're manned, unless it's a professional camera operator, a lot of times in these facilities, it's a it's a volunteer. Um, your volunteers are not always going to be the most diligent when it comes to operating the camera and keeping your subject perfectly centered. And that's where that ability to connect your camera via USB to your gimbal. And again, this is a Ronin RS2, RSC2, RS3, RSC3, and like the new one, the mini RS3 can do this as well. You really just connect a USB into the from camera into Ronin, and then you just turn on active track in the Ronin. And then you just have the person follow them around and then let the camera do the work. Uh, oh, wow. Let the gimbal and camera do the work. That's the easiest way. I don't know if you or Noah want to jump in and talk about this, but are there any resources out there, whether it's an iOS app or a website or something that you could potentially put all these schematics in? Here's the distance from lens. Here's where I want the subject. Here's how tall the subject is. And they could actually see sort of the what the frame or composition may look like. You mean kind of something like that? Yeah. <laughs> is that all in y'all's app? No, I, I'm more thinking app. like a picture. Like, I don't know if they could get uh, a visual yeah, this has representation. A picture. This has a picture too. Okay. So we could do stuff like this. There's a there's a really cool app. I'll send it to you. I'll, okay, I'll, cool. I'll we'll put that in the link it. too. Um, awesome. It's called, right. uh, it's called Pills. It's on Photo Pills. Oh. Yeah. P-H-O-T-O-P-I-L-L-S. Photo Pills. 
Perfect. We'll make sure to link to that as well. Last question. Brad N says, uh, it looks like they have the AWHE130 full HD Panas or professional PTZ camera, which he says I know is discontinued. Uh, but he says, would you recommend upgrading because we're not getting a super clean cinema picture during worship in our low lighting environments? Or are there some settings I can play with first? Yeah, I mean, 130 is going to be a relatively small sensor. I mean, I, if I, I, full disclosure, I work for the Lumix team. Not um, the Panasonic. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I should say this joke, but I'm going to use it. Um, <laughs> every, everybody here is, seems to be cool. Um, so we have the broadcast group. They, they call themselves Panasonic Connect. And then I work for the Lumix group. So if there's any Star Wars fans out there, um, think of the Panasonic Connect broadcast people. Um, think of them as the Jedi Knights. And you're talking to a Sith Lord right now. So I'm like the master of the dark arts when it comes to what we do. That's why there's so much jerry-rigging and making things work. And I hit lower price points. So um, I'm not going to know their product as well as they do. But my understanding is that's probably a third of an inch or a, a half inch sensor. So it's really small. Um, smaller sensors are just going to struggle in lower lighting conditions. So, um, especially with that tight product, aperture. Like the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's a variable aperture lens as well. So as you zoom in, it's going to, the aperture is going to get smaller. So, um, you know, you can go to the 160 or the, the, they have a new model. I think it's the 180, um, that has the, the new cool autofocus system, like what we're doing with the phase autofocus. Um, you could do those cameras, but again, you're in about 10 to 12 grand. Um, to get there. Um, if you want to go PTZ, you know, you might want to consider looking at some of the solutions I've, I've suggested. If you really want a shallow depth of field look with a, with a remote operator camera, um, the data video product will work pretty well for you. And I would probably just do a box camera. I do the BGH one. And then I would probably just take a look at what you need for focal length. But oftentimes our power zoom, this lens here, this 45 to 175 is an F35 to 5.6. So that doesn't seem like it's bright, but remember the sensor is way bigger. So this will get you a really nice shallow depth of field. This lens is like $450. So this lens on a BGH-1, BGH-1 is 2000. This is four, you know, 450, so you're at $2,500 and then 2000 for a pan tilt head. And you know that's gonna be half the price or less of what you would have to pay for a kind of pan tilt zoom solution. I love it. Matt, thank you so much. I want to invite Noah back on. Uh, I want to make sure that as we wrap up, I know that some of y'all's contact information is potentially in the chat. And if not, we'll make sure that we put it in there now. But how? what is the best way people can keep in touch with you? Matt, we'll let you start first and then we'll let Noah take it. I've given you guys my email address. I've given you my cell phone number. It doesn't get much more direct than that. Yeah. So feel free to reach out if you have questions. <laughs> I love that. Noah, how about you guys and Hunts and all the resources you guys are doing? For sure. You guys can check us out online at huntsphoto.com. But if there is anything specific you're looking for, please do shoot me an email. Uh, email is always the best way to get in touch with me. Uh, I got a lot of calls and meetings throughout the day. So we can schedule a time to talk and go over anything that you need. Uh, make sure we give you your dedicated time to answer any questions and get any products ordered that you may be looking for. Uh, we do have some great promotions going on with Panasonic Lumix for this webinar as well. Uh, so keep an eye out for that and all my contact information will be shared with all of you too. So you'll be able to reach out to me if you have any questions or anything coming up uh, that I can assist you with. I love it. I also know you guys are doing something special for the SALT community uh, for this webinar. Is that outside of uh, just Lumix products? Is that everything or... That's so that those special prices are on Lumix products specifically for this webinar. But if there are any products you're looking for outside of the, the Lumix family, uh, please do reach out to me. We carry a little bit of everything. So uh, if you're maybe not a Lumix shooter, maybe you're shooting another system and aren't made, ready to make that switch, uh, but maybe looking for some new gear, some insight, uh, please do reach out. We carry everything from Nikon, Canon, Sony, Olympus, Fuji, and everything in between. Um, cinema stuff, photo stuff, lighting, audio. Uh, uh, you name it, we can get it for you. So please do reach out if you do have any inquiries about any gear or equipment for your church, uh, for any personal needs that you may have or anything else. I love it. Noah, Matt, thank you guys so much for being a part of today's webinar. Really do appreciate it. Thank you, Luke. And uh, I want to thank Panasonic for sponsoring and thank Matt so much for giving this great presentation. Uh, just looking forward to working more with everybody going forward. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, as well. And uh, thank you, Noah, for uh, pointing out you sell other brands. I'm joking. Obviously, <laughs> buy what's going to work best for your needs. So I'm just giving you a hard time.
I love it. I love awesome. it. Awesome. Well, you guys be on the uh, lookout for your inboxes. Uh, we'll be sending uh, the repay link uh, tomorrow, and we'll make sure that we include some of these resources that uh, Matt and Noah mentioned, especially with some links. I also think that Noah and Hunts is going to be a great resource for all of you guys as you start looking at some of the different lenses that Matt referenced, some of the other sort of lens controllers that Matt referenced, uh, as you sort of start piecing together uh, your own hide up the field sort of cinematic look here. So really do appreciate you guys. I want to take a second and mention one resource that we at SALT have put together. Uh, one of the sort of core heartbeats of SALT community and SALT conferences ever since the beginning has been to help make training and knowledge and all these sort of webinars and workshops that we do at conference as accessible as possible to you all. So for the past 10 years, we've been hosting a conference in the fall and we have been recording every single one of those uh, conferences on video and we've put them into a single library and that library is called SALT University. You can go to saltuniversity.com to take a look at that website or that resource. But here's what's amazing about it. Uh, for one price for the year, we allow you to get access to all of those. So that's all 10 years of conferences, keynotes, workshops, pre-conferences, as well as webinars and stuff we've done like this throughout the year. Uh, and you guys can leverage that and you can give up to 50 logins to your team. If you get the all access plan, we give you one step further. And we know that it's the new year. You've got new volunteers that are stepping in. You've got new team members that may be joining your team right now. And we know that there's now a burden to train them and get them up to speed as to everybody else that is serving in your sort of ministries. Or you may have a varying different skill sets across your team. And so our heartbeat behind Salt University is to let you develop training programs so that everybody can be on the same page. So with our all access membership, you can actually go in and set up your own custom training program. We see this a ton for people who are running slides or lyrics on Sunday morning, and it'll actually walk through various different programs. You can upload your own videos to that training portal, or you can use any of the 800 plus videos that are inside the Salt University Library. This may be great for camera operators or sound engineers. So as you guys are thinking about how do you get your team to sort of a better place, I would highly encourage you to take a look at that, saltuniversity.com. You can create your own training programs invite up to 50 team members and they get access to the entire library as well. I am so glad you guys came and checked us out this week. Uh, and we can't wait to see you guys for the March installment of Road to Salt. Stand by for a couple of details on that uh, in the coming weeks, but we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for coming.